I'm a hope everyone is having a great Sabbath today. Uh, it's nice to be back home. You know, McKinnon and I, we uh, flew out to California last week to visit Disneyland. And uh, we ended up spending the night in uh, Dallas, unexpectedly, due to flight cancellations and delays because of the weather. Uh, we, uh, we ended up uh, having a great time, but it was interesting seeing the pandemonium firsthand of everybody in the airport. You know, so I tell you, we, we, we got to the Birmingham airport real early, like we were supposed to be, and uh, our flight left hours late because there was a bad storm in Dallas. And then when we landed in, uh, uh, there's two airports in Dallas, and we landed in the uh, Love, Dallas Love. And when we got off the plane, there was just like people like everywhere, lines and this, and people uh, crying and everything because their flights were being canceled. They were missing this flight. And we get off the plane and McKinnon's looking at me and I'm like, it's gonna be all right, it's gonna be all right. And um, over the loudspeaker, it says, if you're trying to get to California, we got three seats left on this flight at D5. And I went, that's our sign. <laughs> And so we took off running all the way to D5. I say running, I was wobbling. And we got there, and uh, I was like, hey, how do we get on this flight? And he goes, oh, you just need to get in that line. And we turned around, and this line, and I'm not exaggerating, it was like 500 people. And I went, you got to be kidding me. And you know the verse that we always read, uh, or we've read in the Bible where it talks about if those that are in Jerusalem, you know, get out right get out I looked at McKinnon and I said we got to get out of here I mean because it was just and uh, she was like uh, what, what, what do you I said we got to get out of here so we got to find a bar and uh, and what I meant was is in, in airports you know they have these little bars and I was meaning we need to get away from the crowd get over into a corner where it's quiet where I can get on my phone and try to figure out what we're doing you know and she was like why are you wanting to drink? I was like, I'm not wanting to drink. I'm trying to get away from everybody, you know. So, so we end up going into a bar and uh, uh, sitting there for a minute, and we end up changing the airports. We get over to the other airport. That flight gets canceled. There was a bad storm that went through Dallas, and um, and it didn't just go through Dallas. When it got to Dallas, it just sat on Dallas, and it wasn't moving, and it was just there for a long time, and it caused damage to some of the planes and all kinds of stuff and hail. And, so we ended up staying at a hotel. So our trip ended up, at, you know, lasting an extra day, and um, we had a great time. Um, but I changed our flight coming back because the lady said, "Yeah, the weather's supposed to be bad in Dallas this weekend too." And I'm thinking, "Well, we're supposed to fly back too." So I said, "We're going to go through Denver." And as we're coming into Denver, there, hey, there's some weather problems, and I was like, "Oh my goodness!" I took. At one point, McKinnon looked at me and said, can we just go home? And, every, and this was on Tuesday, yeah, and I, or Wednesday. And I looked at her and I said, every flight to Birmingham is canceled. And they were. So I was like, no, unless we get a rental car and drive. But it was a good experience, I think, for her because, you know, she got to see a lot of craziness and how people were. I mean, I, I saw one guy just start screaming and, like, stomping off and, and, and – uh, but it all, to her, um, I finally looked at her and I was trying to get ahead of the, of, of the crowd. And so I finally, I in my mind said, we're not flying out of here tonight. And I said, the next rush is going to be on hotel rooms. And so I said, we need to go ahead, get a hotel room, call it, go get a good night's sleep. And so we walked outside. It was beautiful outside. you know. And we're standing there waiting for our Uber to pull up. And there was a guy and his daughter. And... Uh, he was encouraging his daughter. He said, it's all right. We'll, we'll go another time. And I looked at him and I said, that's the same thing I'm doing. He goes, yeah, we were going on last week's route. And so then McKinnon, she kind of, it, it, it settled her because she thought, man, we were still getting to go where we were going, but they missed the boat, literally. You know? So um, it, was a, it was a good, uh, I guess, daddy-daughter experience. Uh, she's, you know, graduated now. I'm <clears throat> trying to figure out what her rent's going to be and stuff like that. So, yeah. Welcome to the real world, right? But it was, it was, it was crazy pandemonium and seeing just, if you're ever into people watching, watching how people react, overreact, 
and I think she saw with me, I'm just like this, you know, and, um, and, and, and at first she was like, do you not care? And I was like, I'm, I'm fine. I'm trying to find a supply. Calm down. You know, I guess I get that from my dad, but, um, you know, um, we ended up, uh, meeting some different people just hanging out at the airport. And, uh, at, if you remember, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I'm talking too much about this, but if you remember the old movie Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, well, it came that close. There was another guy that was trying to get to California, but he was from Dallas. And he was sitting there with his wife, and a real nice guy, and we were talking to him and his wife. And I almost said, you want to get a rental car and do this? <laughs> and because uh, it was, if we, I'd already calculated, it was 20 hours, and I was thinking, you drive 10, I drive 10, you know. And, uh, and then I started thinking about planes, trains, and automobiles, you know, and I was like, nah, we're just, you know, whatever. So, uh, you know, two weeks ago, right after we left, our country celebrated Memorial Day. And uh, a day that we recognize those who gave their lives for our freedom. You know, and a familiar phrase that you hear, especially around Memorial Day, is when a person goes above and beyond the call of duty, you know. And uh, there's special awards and ceremonies that they give soldiers, uh, not only soldiers, but also policemen and firemen, you know, public servants that uh, go uh, above and beyond the call of duty. You know, when we hear this phrase, we usually think of someone that's either in the military or, or a policeman or, you know, some type of service like that. You know, this phrase is often used when people do their job as they should, you know, but not just doing their job a situation arises where they do more than what their job even calls for, where they sacrifice themselves uh, for others, for the greater good. And, you know, we, over the last few years, obviously we see that all the time with our military, but then with some of the things that we've seen with, uh, you know, uh, firemen rescuing people from burning houses or, or cars or policemen where terrible news where, where people are, maybe shooting people up in a school and they're running in when everybody's running out. You know, obviously we all know that for 9-11 too. Um, you know, um, they're going in the direction where everybody's running from. And, um, but we know that saying, and you, and you, you kind of think about that around Memorial Day, you know. And uh, I know Memorial Day's already passed, but there's something still from us to, to learn from that saying, go above and beyond the call of duty, because when you really think about it, Someone, right, a God, Jesus Christ, went above and beyond the call of duty. He came in the flesh. He died for us, right? And and you and I say it's 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 remarkable what he what he did and accomplished, coming in the flesh, doing without sin. But the thing is, is the reason why he didn't have to do that. Him and God could have just scrapped the whole plan. Could have scrapped the whole plan. And I wanted to start off by going to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And as I was putting this together, I thought, man, they're, they're going to think you always like to go to the book of Genesis. Because um, it seems like the uh, last few times I speak, I always go to the book of Genesis. But in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, I don't know how, how often you think about this verse, but it's one that, that I think we should think about. And it says, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. If Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 never occurred, you and I would not be here. You know? And um, it's, it's God's wanting to grow his family that he and Christ decided to make a human being in their image and breathe life into them and also give them the spirit. And so we see this and, and drop down to verse 16. And it says, and the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may freely eat of every tree in the garden, but you shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day you eat it, dying, you shall surely die. And we know what took place in the garden of Eden. You know, man had this huge opportunity laid in front of him and her because it was Adam and Eve. And they had been made in God's image. Adam had Eve. They were, they, you know, they were together. They were able to communicate with God. We, we know from Scripture. 
And they just had this, really, this one rule. And that one rule was kind of like the, the old saying when you look at the kid and you say, don't get in that cookie jar. And immediately, as soon as the parent left the room, they went for the cookie jar. You know, regardless if it was good for them or not, they chose to do that. Let's jump over to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. And uh, in 3 and verse 1, we're just going to read a few scriptures here. And it says, The serpent was more cunning than any other creature in the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, It is true that God has said, You shall not eat of the tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may freely eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has indeed said, You shall not eat it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And that's interesting. This, this tree was in the middle of the garden. It's in the middle. And the serpent said to the woman, in, uh, in dying, you shall not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, you shall, uh, your eyes shall be open, and you shall be like God, deciding good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasing to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of, the, of its fruit and ate. And she also gave it to her husband uh, with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now, we've read this story many times. But the point that I want to point out here is self-righteousness is a huge problem for many people. And self-righteousness, although even going all the way back to the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve thought they knew better than what God had instructed them. And they took it upon themselves. And yes, we know that, that um, the, the devil, appearing as a serpent, deceived them. But they still took it upon themselves to disobey and to ignore instruction that had been given to them from God, which was not to eat or touch that particular tree. And that's a form of uh, self-righteousness. Adam and Eve took to themselves the responsibility to decide what is right and wrong. And, and also they ignored or chose not to rely on God teaching them. They were going to teach themselves, you know. And I believe it's safe to say that at some point we've all been self-righteous. At some point we've all felt like, no, we, we know what we're doing here, you know, and um, and that's a, a road we don't want to go down. Let's go over to Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah chapter 65. In Isaiah chapter uh, 65, and we're just going to read verses of uh, uh, starting off in two, it says, I have spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people who walk in the way that is not good, even after their own thoughts. You know, and we think about this, I've spread out my hands. This is God, you know, these are God's people, and this is how he's describing them. That even, that, that it's not good. They go after their own thoughts, in other words, their own ways. A people who without ceasing provoke me to my face. You know, provoke me to my face. You think about that. You know, sometimes people will do things behind your back. But God's people, according to what we're reading here, they do it straight to his face. Straight to his face. Who sacrifice in the gardens and burn incense upon the bricks. A people who sit among the graves spend the night in the tombs, who eat swine's flesh. We, you know, we talk about that today. Uh, one of the things that you and I, we go, no, we don't eat pork. Well, there was a time where God's people were ignoring that. And what were they doing? They were eating swine's flesh. And they were doing it to his face and broth of vile things in their vessels, who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me. For I am holier than you. These are a smoke in my nostril, a fire that burns all the day. Behold, it is written before me, I will not be silent. 
except I will repay. Yeah, I will repay into their bosom your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, says the Lord, that they burn incense upon the mountains and blaspheme me upon the hills, and I will measure their former work into their bosom. You know, Israel thought they were holier. Or excuse me, Israel thought they were holy. And at some point they turned that into believing they were holier than God. That they could decide what was right and what was wrong. Very similar to what Adam and Eve did. We see a trend there, right? And the, the ability to decide what is right and wrong. And we see that in our country today. We see that in the world today. You know, when people will say, well, this is what my truth is, right? And, and it's all right to have a, 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 an opinion of something, but people have turned opinions into, no, this is, this is fact. And that's where we get into a very scarce place. And here, these are the people of God that God is trying to communicate with and have a relationship with, and right in front of his face, they're provoking him. They're ignoring him. They're doing things as they see fit. And obviously, if they're God's people, if we're God's people, that would mean that God's given us his spirit. He's given us an opportunity to be a part of his family. And if God's given us his spirit, and at that point we're provoking him, we're ignoring him, we're on very scarce ground. Let's go over to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 31. Jeremiah 2 in verse 31, and it says, O generation, see the word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness to Israel or a land thick of darkness? Why do my people say, we roam freely? We will come no more to you. Can a virgin forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me. Now listen to this. Days without numbers. My people haven't just forgotten me. They've forgotten me so long, you know, that it's, you can't even keep count. And uh, it's interesting, that's kind of what, you know, Bill's song was about, about, you know, we all have individuals that we know that for one reason or another, not to judge, and we, we need to be praying for those individuals. And we also need to pray that we don't go down that road have went right back into what we thought we were coming out of. You know? And when we read this verse, my people have forgotten me days without numbers. We need to make sure that if we're guilty of this, and I'm sure we all at some point have been, that we repent of it, that we thank God for opening our eyes to it, and that we try to prevent it from happening again. And, you know, we're going into Pentecost, which is a great time. You know, you think about the apostles. When they were with Christ, they were walking, you know, with their shoulder, you know, back. And then after he was taken into captivity, they, they you know, their whole idea of what was supposed to take place was shattered. And they dispersed. And then when he reappeared to them and then began to teach them and they realized, oh, that's what's going on here. That's what's happening here. And they had to wait. He told them to wait in Jerusalem that they were going to receive power. Can you imagine what was going through their minds between the period of that time to Pentecost of them waiting to receive power? How many times they were just scratching their head going, I can't believe we didn't know. How did we miss that? How did we not understand what he was telling us? Why did we think that we were going in there? Why, why did I pull my knife out and cut the soldier's ear off? Why, why did we flee? Why did I deny him three times? Why, you know, all the, the various things that might have been going through their head leading up to Pentecost, where we heard the message that Kaki read in the scripture reading today that was given. They've forgotten me days without number. We need to make sure we're not falling into that. Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 29. Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 13. And this 
the, the thing that's interesting and where I'm kind of going with this is the, the reason why they're forgetting God without number, it seems to be self-righteousness. That this ability that God opens their eyes to understanding and at some point they look at God and say, we got this, we don't need you anymore. We understand. In fact, we know how to keep the Sabbath day. We're going to add laws to your laws. We're going to make some changes here. Hey, it's all right to do this or to do that. We're, we're in control now, you know, self-righteousness. And that's what we have to make sure that we don't fall into. In Isaiah chapter uh, 29 and verse 13, we read, And the Lord said, Because this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips honor me. All right? We want to be those people that, that honor God with our mouth and our lips. But we also want to go further, right? Because the next part says, But their worship of me is made up of the traditions of men learned by note. And their uh, fear toward me is taught by the commandments of men. So we read here, we must make certain that our hearts are in the right place. Because our words can be deceitful, you know. We can talk a good game, but do we deliver on it? You know, our actions are really where the proof is, right? That's what James taught us. Faith without works is what? Dead. If you have faith, it says, show me your faith by your works, right? We have to be trees that produce fruit. We can become those that speak of God and his way, and yet it isn't how... We really live. And that's what we have to, to be careful of. You know, we have to make sure that we're correcting those those errors in our in our lives. Let's go over Second Timothy. Second Timothy. I'm gonna tell you what, I went just a few months ago, got an eye exam, got new contacts. I'm gonna have to go back because my contacts are terrible when I'm trying to read. I, I can look back and I can see everybody, you know. Um, but but I guess that would be my far, when you can't read like close, that's far sighted, right? Is that right? Okay. So anyway, man, it is just blurry as anything. But um, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, that's 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, it says, I charge you, therefore, in the sight of God, even the Lord Jesus Christ, who is ready to judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be urgent in season and out of season. You know, that right there, in season and out of season, you know, is referring to God's holy days. At least that's the way I you know, perceive that. But it's so important that when God's holy days roll around that you hear messages about those holy days. And um, the, the more times you observe those holy days, you should be growing in knowledge on those days. So it's very important to, to preach the word um, in season and out of season. And it says, be urgent in the season, out of the season, convict, rebuke, Encourage with all patience and doctrine. That's something we need to make sure that we're being with each other is patient. It's patient. You know, sometimes you can look at someone and they might have a, a question and you might have the exact answer for that question. And it might be the perfect answer for that question. Backed up biblically and everything. And you present it to that person and it goes right over their head. You can't be impatient. Okay, we have to make sure we're being patient with each other, even when to you it seems obvious, right? Because there there will be times where people will ask you questions about things and, and you give them an answer and it's just as clear as anything to you because you want that same patience when someone's trying to explain something to you. And so we need to make sure we continue to exercise patience. For there shall come a time when they will not tolerate sound doctrine. There'll come a time when they don't uh, tolerate sound doctrine. And we need to be uh, aware of that. But according to their own lust, they shall accumulate to themselves a great number of teachers, having ears itching to hear what satisfies their cravings. You know, yesterday, 
uh, Neil and I were, were talking with a gentleman, and we were talking a, a, about a, a church that is very large uh, in the whole state of Alabama, to be honest with you, probably regionally. And we were just talking about how this church, how do they get so many people in there, you know? And a lot of it has to do with it's a production. And when you look here, you see getting teachers that, you know, satisfy their itching ears. You know, sometimes we, the people sitting in, in the, the seats at a church, we may want to hear a message about this, this, or this, but that might not be the message we need to hear. We might need to hear something else, you know? It's, it's, and now I'm not saying it's not good to, to, to let people know, hey, if we could ever talk about this, I'm, I've got an interest in that. I'm not speaking of that. But when you, when you only talk about things that's, that are easy, that are satisfying, that really don't cut us any, that don't make us grow any, then you're getting into to playing favorites. And it says this right here, they accumulate to themselves a great number of teachers having ears itching to hear what satisfies their cravings. That's not where we need to be. That's not where we need to be. And they shall turn away their own ears from the truth, and they shall be turned aside unto myths. And we, we kind of see that today in society, especially in Christianity, where somehow, some way, fairy tales and fables and myths have become a central part of what people call Christianity. And you say, well, you know, Santa Claus and Easter bunnies, and, you know, and stuff like that. And, and you say, God's worth is, is truth. It, it, it's not a fairy tale. You know, I was in Disneyland where it's all about fairy tales. You know, I was in fantasy land, you know, seeing all kinds of things that people have come up with and ideas and stuff. And they're, they're fun. But when it comes to the word of God, we don't need myths and fables and fairy tales. This is important stuff, right? And so, but as for you, be vigilant in all the things, endure hardships, do the work of an evangelist, fully carry, carry out your ministry, for I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. And I, I read a little further than I needed to. I was going to stop in four. But it's amazing how God's word predicted thousands of years ago what would happen and it happened then and it's happened now. And, you know, we hear this saying all the time, history repeats itself. Well, in these categories, history repeats itself because men are self-righteous. And that common thread is who? Is Satan. At some point, he makes us think that we got this. That, you know, here, we don't really need this. I, I, know, the, I know enough of the scripture, right? But we're told here in the scripture to search it out diligently. And diligently requires studying. Requires us to, to read and look up things and talk to people and iron sharpening iron. And that, you know, one of the other big movements uh, that you hear today is, I don't really need to go to church. You know, you don't have to go to church to get to heaven. You hear that a lot, you know. And the thing is, is, is we do need church because we need each other. And, uh, you know, we need the ability to, to talk with like-minded believers, to encourage one another. Uh, you know, why did God create Eve? It wasn't good for man to be alone. And that goes both ways. It's not good for women to be alone. You know, we, we need each other. We need to communicate with each other and we help each other. And, you know, one of the questions that comes up especially when you look at, at what we just read here in Timothy, as, as people uh, begin to go their own way, and also when uh, people no longer um, listen to sound doctrine and they begin to go astray, is are God's people asleep right now? You know, and understanding we don't know who all God's people are. And God's people, there's, some of God's people are here. Some of God's people are in various other churches that, that we know people at. And there's some of God's people that are on this earth that we're not even aware of. I'm sure of this, right? When we look at verse 3, we see 
that the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but will follow after their own lust and want to be taught what they want to hear. Uh, do we see that spirit today of, of we will decide what is right and what is wrong? We definitely see it in society today, and that spirit is of Satan. He is our arch enemy, and he is really good at what he does. And I don't know if you, you, you know, we all know that Satan's powerful, and he's the, um, the prince and power of the air and all of these various things, but one of the things that hit me not long ago is that He's so powerful that he was able to deceive fellow angels to follow him. We're talking about other beings that are fully aware of God and his power, that, that knew God existed. And he was able to convince them, follow me, I got a better plan. That's, that's, that's a powerful form of deception. And we need to be on guard for that. Let's go to Hebrews uh, chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. Man, I didn't come up with a good joke either. Well, let me tell you something. If you've ever been to Disney World and you've ever been on the, uh, the, the uh, Jungle Cruise, and you know how the little guy on the boat tells the corny jokes the whole way through? The Jungle Cruise that we got on, I mean, he, from start to finish, he was like on top of his game. He was just left and right dropping them, and I thought it was great. You know, and I didn't, luckily for you, I didn't remember any of them. But man, he was, he was, he was, he was really good. A lot of the ones I've written in the past, you know, they'll throw one or two out there. This guy from, I, I don't, might have been his first day, because I, if there's a book, he was reading the whole book the whole way through, but. You know, and of course, you know, we got to see the backside of water, you know, so some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about, but one day you will. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, and it says, uh, now without faith, it is impossible to please God, for it is mandatory for the one who comes to God to believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, diligently seek him. Right? And so we have to make sure that we diligently seek him. It's not enough to just say, oh, I believe there's a God. Because we know what? Satan believes there's a God. And he believes also there's Christ. Right? And he believes without a doubt that Christ died for our sins. He knows all of these things. We've got to go further than that. And we have to have faith. And what is faith? Faith without works is dead. You know, as time goes on, we must continue to remind ourselves that it's going to get harder. It is going to get harder, right? It's going to get more difficult. I was thinking about this because I was late getting here today. I said, man, you know, I can't say well, I got caught in traffic because of the Bogans. The Bogans live, they drive right past my exit. And just one time could y'all be late. Please. Just once. Oh, man. You know, I was thinking, I was like, I said, well, I can't say traffic because I know the Vogels are there. But y'all, I mean, you know, y'all leave a lot. Y'all were doing a better job than I am. But uh, Satan is going to pick up his attacks to the point where people will stop enduring. We, we, we know that from Scripture. But you and I must remember this verse. We must diligently seek him, even if we're sitting by ourselves. You know, there's one thing that COVID taught us. You know, it may have taught you a lot of things. But one of the things that, that uh, COVID taught us was, guess what? Even when we were told that we couldn't assemble here, we, we, ha we had some technology ways that we could still have services. We did it uh, online or, or call in, right? Remember that? And, um, um, you know, we, we have to be that type of Christian to overcome and to adapt. And regardless of what's going on, we're going to keep the Sabbath, right? And we're going to figure a way to learn about God and, and observe his holy days. We must continue to grow in faith. We must continue to believe that regardless of how awful it's going to get on this earth, regardless of how long God delays his return, it might not happen in our lifetime, that we don't become self-righteous. That we don't start making our own religion or living our own lives as we see fit. 
that we still use the Scripture, the Word of God, and going to Him in prayer and meditation to find our answers in life. That's what we have to make sure that we continue doing. God is going to reward those who seek Him diligently. You know, you think about the Scripture that Kathy read earlier. You know, men and, men and women, and what did they say? What can we do? They realized they had made a mistake. And that's what you and I have to take from that verse. When we realize we've made mistakes, when we fell short, when we've missed the mark, or when we've gotten completely off the bus, what, what must we do? And the answer is very simple. Repent. Get back to the word, right? As uh, we used to hear, get back to the trunk of the tree, so to speak. Get back to the basics. Getting back to the basics, although it sounds basic, is, is profound, right? The basics, if you stay there, you grow. You really do. Everybody wants to act like there's something new. No, it's, 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 it's sticking to the basics, sticking to the root, right? There's safety there. And uh, making sure that we don't become self-righteous uh, and start making, like I said, our own decisions. God is going to reward those who seek him diligently. We can learn so much from the story of Job. And I thought we'd talk about Job a little. Here we have a man that was blessed. He was living his life on this earth in peace. And what was he doing? He was following God's ways, right? Let's go to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. And, you know, I don't know about you, but when you read Job 1, verse 1, you know, it, it's, it's a remarkable verse. And it says, there was a man in the land of uh, us whose name was Job, and the man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and turned aside from evil. Can you imagine having just that verse to describe you? right that is a that is an honor for job you know one day when job's resurrected i would imagine if he sees that that's how he's uh described that he'll cry you know that's that's an amazing verse now how would you you know like to know that that was the way you were described but as the story unfolds we learn that Job, he wasn't perfect. He did have an issue. He did have an issue. And in Job 33, and I'm just referencing this, we see that Job begins to question, why me? Because all these terrible things started happening. Why me? And you know, we're going to have bad things that happen in our life. And we can take one or two approach, right? Really three. One is you can just do nothing. But one is you can say, why me? Why am I being punished? You know, and you can, you know, sad me, right? Or you can see that this is your opportunity to overcome. That this is your opportunity to get through it. You know, I know it's not the same. It's physical. But me and McKinnon, we were right there for it. And I remember looking at her one time and I said, hey, look, we can be panicking or we can just calm down. We're going to figure out what we're going to do. Everything's going to be all right. And luckily, everything got worked out. And that's how we got to have that same type of focus, that with God, all things are possible. We have faith. We know he's going to, he's going to provide a way, right? He's going to make a way for us. His word tells us he will. And if we're living our life in a perfect manner, why would God allow bad things to happen to us? Well, why? Because we need to be tested. Right? And it's, we have to prove ourselves. Why did Christ have to come and do the things he had to do? Right? Why do we have to experience these trials and temptations in life? If we aren't careful, we too begin to act as someone that is what? Self-righteous. Well, I'm keeping the Sabbath. I'm keeping God's holy days. I'm doing this. Why are these? Why am I uh, having these things happen to me? Right? No, that's exactly why those things are going to happen. Because you're being tried. You're being made uh, or, or prepared for something greater. Let's go over to Job chapter 35 and verse 2. Job chapter 35 and verse 2. And we read here, 
In Job chapter 35, verse 2, it says, Do you think this is to be right? My righteousness is more than God's. You know, our God is perfect, and his decisions are perfect and are filled with mercy. And we need to always be careful to acknowledge that we aren't able to see things as God does. If we ever are going through trials and tribulations and we wonder, why is God putting this on me? You know, or, or why is Satan coming at me so hard or, or, or what have you? We got to try to see things from God's view, from God's vantage point. And it's very, I'm not saying it's easy, but if we look at the big picture, what's being accomplished? What happens if we overcome? What happens if we persevere? What happens if we endure? What happens if we uh, 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 apply the scripture as Christ did when Satan was tempting him and we shoot him down? What does it say? Satan will leave if you resist him. And so we have to keep that in mind of what is the bigger picture? What's the bigger picture? And I believe that from this period to Pentecost, that is exactly what the apostles' eyes were being opened to, the bigger picture. Because they had this picture of Christ going in and setting up a in-flesh kingdom in Jerusalem. And he exposed them after he was resurrected to the bigger picture. The bigger picture of now on the day of Pentecost, they are giving sermons or messages to the individuals that were calling for the death of Christ. And they're baptizing those people. Those people would have been the people days before that they, oh no, you remember? And no, I, I didn't know him. I wasn't with him. And now they're baptizing those people. In other words, they're calling those people brethren brothers and sisters. There's a lot to learn from that. In Job chapter, let's go over to Job chapter 42 and verse 1. Job chapter 42 and verse 1. And it says, And Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that you thought, and that, excuse me, and that no thought can be withheld from you. You asked, Who is he who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have spoken that which I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, yeah, which I did not know. Here I beseech you, I will speak. You said, I will ask of you and you will declare to me, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, right? He had heard of God and he was trying to, 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 to worship God and live his life godly, right? We know that from Job chapter 1. And he thought he understood God. But then what does he say here? But now my eyes have seen you. And therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. We cannot understand the power of God. Whatever we think he is, it's so much more. Whatever we think he can accomplish, it's so much more. And Job came to realization of that. He almost looked at God as just another individual, you know, that he could have conversation with. And what did he say? I, I've heard of you, but now I see you and I abhor myself. You know, he just put himself way down. And we have to understand, and it's not easy, and I'm not by no means saying I understand completely, but we have to try to always look at the bigger picture. What is God trying to accomplish here? What, why, are, why is this happening in your life? Why is this not happening in your life? Right? What is God trying to accomplish? We all have an image in our minds that what God is, and Job did as well, and he realized very quickly that God was much more than what even he could imagine. God is wonderful that we can't even understand his presence and how amazing it is. I mean, we know from Moses seeing the backside of, of what we now know was Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. And what did Moses walked around with a white face for the rest of his life? Just saw his backside. And now, in, in, in honesty, if we were to ever come in the full presence of God, it would kill us if we were in the flesh. 
And so therefore, one day we're going to have to be changed so that we can be in his presence. Not just made clean and pure, but spiritually have to be changed because flesh cannot, we cannot even stand before him. And Job thought that he understood God in his power, but then he realized God was so much more. And when he came to this understanding, what did he do? He repented in dust and ashes. Now, when's the last time you repented in dust and ashes? I've never done it. Have you ever repented in dust and ashes? Don't have to show of hands. What is that? I mean, I've, I've went to God and, and asked for forgiveness for things, and there's some things that I've prayed to God about multiple times for forgiveness, but I've never repented in dust and ashes. Is it just a figure of speech? I don't believe it is. When you think about it for a moment, we have all repented before to God in private, various things. But when people hold you in a high regard, you know, you walk in this, this church building and there may have been something terrible that I did this week. You're not aware of it. I've went to God and I've repented for it. And I walk in here and you shake my hand and it's fine. But repenting of something in dust and ashes is a public, is a public expression for people to see. And Job, this individual that had went through hell on earth, so to speak, at the end of it, what does he do? He sees what God was doing and what God was accomplishing. He saw where he was wrong. And he repented in front of public, in front of people in dust and ashes where they saw, you know. In other words, for people to go, he must have done something. He did something wrong. And he repented in dust and ashes. Think about that for a moment. You know, I know we repent to God in private. But at sometimes you might have to repent of something you did in public. And, and Job felt moved to do this in dust and ashes. One thing uh, that was accomplished was people saw that Job was asking God for forgiveness for something that, and that Job wasn't perfect. That Job was, was although we at the beginning of Job we read he was blameless, he, he wasn't above dropping down in front of whoever saw him and, and putting dust and ashes on himself and just admitting that he was nothing without God. Now, I'm not trying to encourage people to bring dust and ashes up here, but, but think about that, the, the, the power and what that re represents. And, I, and one of the things that I thought of, and that might be something for you to look into and read more about, but where do we come from? We're from the dust. And it's also, I think, an acknowledgement of, I'm just dirt. I'm literally, we're all just dirt without God. You know, ashes to ashes, as we've heard at, at, at various funeral services. Let's go to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. And in Matthew chapter 19, uh, we read uh, verse 16. And this is something that we've read before. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 16, Now at that time, one came to him and said, Good master, what good things shall I do that I shall have eternal life? And he said to them, Why do you call me good? Now if there was ever a human being that walked on the face of the earth, that you are well to say he's perfect, it was Jesus Christ. But while he was in the flesh, he was giving you and I an example that the flesh is not good at all. And what does he say? No one is good except one, God. But if you desire to enter into life, keep the commandments. Now, people use this verse to, to, to you know, the importance of keeping the commandments. I'm using it for the example of today is there's really nothing good in this flesh. And Christ gave us that perfect example of saying, no, God, right? The other verses I didn't write down, our righteousness is as filthy rags. We've all sinned, we've all fell short with the exception of Christ. 
Let's go to John chapter 14 and verse 10. John chapter 14 and verse 10. And uh, in John chapter 14 and verse 10, we read, uh, Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak for my own self, but the Father himself who dwells in me does the work. Christ knew that it was the power of God's Holy Spirit that was doing the work, not him. And, you know, we're coming up to a day where uh, the apostles, you know, the day of Pentecost, the day of receiving God's Holy Spirit, and they received the power of God's Holy Spirit. If we, like Christ, can comprehend this in our everyday life, it's a huge step in protecting us from becoming self-righteous. But it's also a huge step in helping protect us and, and encourage us to take on the trials and, and tribulations and the temptations that we're encountered with because we know we've got some of God's Holy Spirit. We know that there's a bigger plan. We know that something bigger is being worked out here, right? That our time on this earth is just like that. Even if we live to be a hundred, it's just a drop in the bucket, you know? And, you know, one of my favorite movies is Dead Poet Society. And at the beginning of the movie, when Robin Williams has all those young students lean in at the trophy uh, uh, case, and there's pictures of young boys that had went through the school years before then that were all at that time dead. You know, if time goes on, one day you won't be here. And then if time goes on a little further, there'll come a time where nobody even remembers you except for God the Father and Jesus Christ. Remember the bigger picture because when you're asleep, there's only one who can wake you. And that's looking at the bigger picture. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20. Uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20. You know, uh, Lauren a few years ago did some research of our family, and she pulled up several, like went way back. And we had a, um, a great grandfather who was um, who, who died shortly after the Civil War, and he's buried uh, here in Birmingham. And um, um, he was actually a, a Union soldier. And uh, we got a picture of his tombstone, went out and visited it. And one of the things that crossed my head was, you know what? How many years has it been since a family member has visited this tombstone? And when you start thinking about that kind of thing, you, you really realize how much you need God and his resurrection. Because eventually... You will be forgotten if, it, if, it's, if it's just up to man, right? Until maybe a great-grandchild does some research and looks you up, you know. But then they still didn't know you. They just came and visited your tombstone, right? In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20, For I say to you, unless your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, there is no way that you shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. We've read this scripture many times, but please let it sink in. The scribes and the Pharisees were individuals that would tell you that they diligently studied God's Bible, the Holy Scripture, at the time, scrolls, right? But they missed the mark, and that's what you and I have got to make sure that we don't do. Their righteousness was because they kept themselves separated from the world. They didn't speak to certain people, as you recall. You know, they thought more of themselves than they ought to, right? They were definitely not ones that would be repenting in dust and ashes. And that's where you have to, we have to make sure we don't fall into that. In other words, their righteousness, their being perfect and upright was because 
the way they lived their not life, not because of God's help. It was the way they were living, the way the choices that they were making that made them perfect in their eyes. But Christ said they were dead bones inside, right? And we have to make certain that any accomplishments that we have, they're, they're to God's glory. That any shortcomings that we have, that we, we ask God for his mercy. And that anything that we're going through, we try to see that bigger picture. I believe we see a modern day example of this with monks. Right? Have you ever seen some of these monks for, for various religions? They live in a monastery. They pray all day. They, they, they separate themselves to the, from the world. How is that being a light to others? Right? Is this the type of commitment Christ seeks from us? I don't believe it is. He wants us to be light to others. Let's go to Matthew chapter 11 and uh, verse 27. Matthew chapter 11, verse 27. It says, All things were delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. <clears throat> Neither does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son personally chooses to reveal Him. Come to me, all you who labor and are overly burdened, and I will give you rest. Right? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. I'm meek and lowly in heart. This is, this is not about us being uh, puffed up. It's not about us being prideful. Right? This is about us being truthful with ourselves. That we are from the dirt. That without God we have no hope. And you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, Christ tells us his way is easy and his burden is light. But the key is we must want to learn from him directly. We got we to gotta figure out how to follow him in his ways. Today, things have been turned upside down. People are taught today that Christ's yoke is easy. Sounds good so far, but that you, you know, a believer decides what laws he or she's going to keep. And that many of these things are done away with. And, and we know that's not true. What the world calls Christianity today sounds a lot like self-righteousness. Where And although it, it may not appear to be that way, it's, it's fashioned in a bow, but really when you get down to it, it's you deciding what you want to do or what you're not going to do. And that is self-righteousness. The actual yoke that Christ spoke of about is easy and his burden is light, but today we're told it's done away with. Um, this too was predicted in Scripture. If we go to 1 John chapter 5, Let's go to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1, and we read, uh, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been begotten by God, and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him also who has been begotten by him. But this standard we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. That's that yoke. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Obeying God and keeping his way of life is not a burden. Uh, it's actually a relief, right? Enjoying the Sabbath, knowing that's a day. Nope, can't work today. I got to take it easy. Got to learn about God. Got to grow closer to God. Um, those are the the type um, things that that we find shelter in, so to speak. And hopefully, um, they they provide us um, uh, with relief from a long work week, so to speak. Let's go to Amos chapter five and verse twenty one. Amos chapter five and verse twenty one. And, and in Amos chapter 5, verse 21, it says, I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Now, 
obviously God's not talking about his feast days. He says, I hate your feast days. I hate your solemn assemblies. He wants us to love his days and his assemblies, his ways. Those are what he created for us to teach us. And I know I've got you flipping back and forth, but let's go back to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 and verse 16. Romans chapter 6 and verse 16, it says, Don't you realize that to whom you yield yourselves as servants to obey, you are servants of the one you obey, whether it is of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. We can simplify things down to one or two ways. God's way or Satan's way. That's it. You know, and, and that's, that's the thing we have to understand. If you want to be self-righteous, you are more than welcome to do so. But if it is contrary to God's way, then you're going Satan's way. Because there's only God's way and Satan's way. There's right and there's wrong. There's not another one that's called your, your, your way, your truth. We're called to follow God's way. God's way hasn't been done away with and can be found in the scriptures. Satan's way is all the other ways that aren't God's ways. Now you think about that. So whatever's contrary to God's way, you know, there's people that worship God on every day of the, of, of the week. God says this day. So as we get closer to Pentecost, think about the lessons we can learn from that are in the Bible. You know, the Job, the Pharisees, the children of Israel, and how they were disobedient, how they had the opportunity, but yet they want to go their own way, and how thankful we should be that God put these examples for us to read. And that not only can we read them, that even today with technology, I mean, you can even listen to them as you're driving down the road if you need to. They're in your, your, your phone where you can pop it up and read it at any time. And, you know, we should be thankful for that because it's, it's definitely not something that's suppressed. And even after our self-righteousness, you know, led us into sin, God designed a plan. You know, you'll go back to the Garden of Eden. It was that self, you know, I'm, we're, we're going to eat that, that tree. We're going to eat that fruit. But even after man did that, that his son, our Savior, came to this earth and went above and beyond the call of duty. That they put together a plan so that you and I, that things could be made right. That we could be forgiven. And Christ died for each of us to give us this opportunity so that one day we could be in the kingdom of heaven. Right? And Pentecost has a lot to do with those doors being open. And as we get closer to Pentecost, remember the power that comes with God's Holy Spirit. But also remember the dangers of becoming overconfident, of becoming, you know, that person. We, I think I read the verse last week. Anyone that thinks he stands tall, take heed. We don't need to fall into that, into that group of, of being overconfident. We need to be sure, for sure, in, in our faith in God but not overconfident in ourself. And that's where we fall into that sin of self-righteousness. And hopefully by applying some of these lessons and principles, we can become better Christians and people in God's kingdom.